I'm Martin Zen, Faith Hill Radio, and I'm from the ECF. Join me live for the first time in every week where I can try to Faith Hill Radio Council and help you understand all these things that are off the road. It's two hours of knowledge on every experience that you have. Hope to see you there. Did you know that Spaced Out Radio runs seven days a week? Hi, it's James Tyson from Spaced Out Weekend. Every Saturday and Sunday night, starting at 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern, you can join me and my guests for some great chatter about what's going on out in the universe and what you can in that dark part of the basement you really don't want to get back into. Let's find the answers to your experiences together. So come on up to Uncle Jimbo's cabin on the weekend. For more information, look us up at Spaced Out Radio. Would you like to connect with us on Spaced Out Radio? Yeah, the Spaced Out Radio. Radio. Not sure radio. Check out the latest shows, guests, and sponsors. And don't forget to sign up for the Space Travelers Club. You'll find all you need at spacedoutradio.com. Welcome back to Space Out Radio tonight. I am your host, Dave Scott. Good to have you with us on this Tuesday night, early Wednesday morning. If you are on the East Coast, good to have you all here tonight as we do this thing seven days a week, starting at 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern time. I host Monday through Friday. Uncle Jimbo and Elizabeth Anglin are here Saturday and Sunday night for Spaced Out Weekend. And thank you so much for everyone participating in the chat rooms of the SOR Space Travelers on Facebook, Spaced Out Radio's chat room on Spreaker, and, of course, all of you on Revolution Radio's chat room. Thanks so much for being with us. Remember, if you are part of the Revolution Radio team, send in a donation because Revolution Radio is a donation station financed by you, the valued lister. Hook it up today and keep it going for this great broadcasting team. Tomorrow night on the show, Rob Morphy will join us, the crypto historian from Cryptopia.us. We're going to get into some more weird and strange creatures of the night around North America. Well, some of the day, too. But that's what we do. If you want to follow us on Twitter, you can do so at Spaced Out Radio. Give our Facebook page a like, Spaced Out Radio Show. On Instagram, I can be followed at Dave Scott, S-O-R. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, Spaced Out Radio Show. And our website is spacedoutradio.com. While on our website, you can check out the S-O-R Space Wire by our newest director, Eric Markham. You can also check out our great music that runs right through our show on spaceoutradio.com and on Spreaker. That is, of course, the guitar god himself, Ron Bumblefoot, Ball, formerly of Guns N' Roses, who does all of our music for this show. And you can read our latest blogs by on with you, emotional commitment to fans. Try and write it out there. I'd love your response on that if you would either. And you can join the SOR Space Travelers Club. It only costs five bucks a month. With that entry, you could be like Joe Elgin, win prizes. The final Friday of every month, we make a prize draw. So you can win some prizes there. And you can also have a private section for posting on our website. You get private group interview access. You get a monthly newsletter. The interviews and the newsletter are being set up as we speak. And so much more. Unlike the other guys, we give you a heck of a lot more than just access to our archives. So, two hours down, we had John Ventry on. JohnVentry.com is his website. We were talking about the expert UFO incident, where he said he believes it was a spy satellite that came crashing down, not a UFO in Kingsford on December 9th, 1965. John joined us for the first two hours. We bring in Eric Squared here for hour number three, as we did last night. We got Eric Markham from the SOR Space Wire and Eric Cooper from Forest Moon Paranormal and S4. Gentlemen, good to have you back. Oh, it's always awesome to be here. It is always fun to have you here as well. So let's start off with it. John Ventry had a very good argument tonight, Coop, in regards to the Kecksburg incident being a satellite and not a UFO. What's your take on this? Here, here's my take, and I can, don't get me wrong, I can get completely on board with not everything being E.T. Um, I don't think everything is E.T., not by a long shot. And I can get on board with 
you know, he was there, would not know what happened, but he was actually there doing research on it. And I can get on board with that. My problem with what he said is anytime you have, okay, and if an, any aircraft goes down, they are going to rope it off. I, I've done active investigation uh, training and whatnot. Um, when I was in aviation, if we had a, an Apache go down because of the sensitive material that's on the helicopter, for example, it would be barricaded off. It would be blocked off. And it would be guarded for 24 hours until, and we were in Germany when I was in the Apache unit. And it would be on, on guard until the active investigation team came from DC. Now, if that was space junk, if that was just something uh, I don't know, randomly falling from the sky that was not an ET craft, and I can get on board of that. Um, why was the military there if it wasn't something sensitive? And if it was a, a, a radiation risk, <laughs> I'm sorry, but no, they're not going to just throw it up on a flatbed truck and throw a couple tarps over it and go traipsing it off to their base. That's not going to happen. Um, if there was a radiation risk, which if it came from space, or probably was anyway, that area would have been secure for a lot longer than it was. And so, was it ET? Who's to say? Um, if it was sensitive, it very well could have been a spy satellite. It very well could have been um, so, something similar to the, the bell from the Nazis, you know. Um, but that's where I stand. I think there's a lot more to the story than, than what's being told. Eric Markham, what is your opinion? Well, look at the paranoia in that era. And maybe they didn't know what, you know, they didn't know what it was. They just had something that broke out of orbit or... There's so much about that. I mean, there's actually pictures of this thing that looks like a, a bad 50s movie monster with glowing eyes that was passed around the papers. And if it was a satellite, I believe they would have handled it, you know, with the military. Because, you know, they don't know if it's ours, the Soviets, or what. So I think they were trying to do some kind of damage control. I'm kind of on board that I, it might not have been. It just dawned on me, though, they mentioned how it didn't just crash. It seems like it maneuvered around a little bit, like it tried to take off again. Coop, you remember reading something about that? Or either one of you? It seems like it moved through the woods after it crashed or tried to take off. It was just an ammonia smell. I, 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 don't, I don't remember that was uh, with... That, I remember that was Rendlesham. Rendlesham did crash, though. But if Rendlesham moved through the woods, I remember hearing anything about Kecksburg. If I remember right, Kecksburg just crashed. And, yeah, the military was there rather quick. And for them to, and that's the other part of my problem with it, yeah, somebody was tracking them. Because for the military to be there within 40 minutes, like the, you know, like the record state, that's really odd to me. Yeah, that's true. Uh, I mean, there was there was also it supposedly it had some kind of uh, weird hieroglyphics running around the bottom part of that, it. Yeah. Exactly, and, and you know what? That's a question I forgot to ask, John. I had it yeah, written down. Yeah, I was just. I, yeah, I was going to ask that too. I forgot. Of course, yeah. uh, Air Force would just said it was the tape that the <laughs> it was taped together <laughs> with, with toy toy maker. Like right. Roswell. Well, because if you remember, right, Roswell, yeah, Roswell had the same, uh, same symbol. Yeah, I've heard that they said that. It, it mm -hmm. say. Well, you know what? It's one of those debates that will continue. We do know that there are official answers out to this, except we know that they will never be disclosed, Joe. No, no, and they'll never be. Disclosed. The truth will never be told. We need a time machine just so we can go back to some of these weird instances, observers, and say, oh, it wasn't a weather balloon, or oh, wow, damn, it really was just a weather balloon. That would be, <laughs> that would be my thing, I think. Going, 
Right. They're and, alive. And, and Jill out here, out here is uh, saying here is the same thing as the Kexburg maneuver and change direction before it hit. Okay, I thought I had heard something about that. Yeah. That it wasn't Thank you, just Joe. a ballistic, if I remember right, it wasn't just a ballistic type of trajectory and like it tried to correct it. So. And, I, okay, uh, I, another thing to bring up with that, if it corrected itself and it changed trajectory, it didn't hit their impact at full, you know, at full force, then why would they have to weld it or uh, cut it out? Oh, that's right. They were supposedly wedged in a tree, maybe? Right. Oh. I mean, you're, st you're still going to have some impact there, but not like they're showing in the reports. With the heat, maybe not it burned its way into the tree? It could have. Because it came down. They say it, that it, it was a, like a fireball. Mm -hmm. so, you know, if it came down in a very thick area of woods, it could have burned into the... I don't know. That's like I said, that's one we'll never know. There's so many different reports, and you don't know how much of it was just the local guy with the local paper thinking, ah, here's my Pulitzer. <laughs> Now, and now for a future for a future discussion, I do have people in Kingman, Arizona, that are that are with me, Fun, and we can get more information on the Kingman uh, crash as well. I just okay. don't, I don't have that access right now because I've heard a lot about the Kingman, Arizona crash too. I've got a friend that lives there. I'll reach out to him. Use this mm -hmm. friend. I, that could be a good source if he's heard anything about it. I have no friends in Kingman, Arizona, or Arizona at all, so I can't help them. But I can do some good research on them. I promise you, I promise you I will. How often do you guys think, and Eric Markham, I'll stick, start with you here, because you're not only educated in science, but you are also ex Navy as well. How many UFO crashes do you think have happened? Do you think it's one a year that maybe we're, we're covering up? Maybe one every couple of years that we're covering up? I have to ask myself, what is it about Earth? These people can make it all the way from wherever they get here and they wreck their flying saucer. I, if, if, they're, if they're, well, they've got the Built by yeah, Ford. Smart, no. Oh, no. Go there. <laughs> no, but I'm saying, if, what is it? Is it our McNeese? You would think they would be smart if they're smart enough to get here. Why are they crashing their UFOs once they're here? Is it a way of defecting? Or are they trying to feed us? Is this their way of maybe getting around the rules if there's an agreement about what's going on? <laughs> Yeah, it's like, oh, damn, yeah, you know, we were going to turn it over, you know, but, you know, we ran out of gas and crashed right there in the desert. I, you know, I'm, still a firm, I'm still a firm believer on another Ford recall, but that's just me. Fourth yeah. disclosure. Yeah, could be. Or a workaround that might be saying, you know, you can't let your technology get in the hands of the talking monkeys over there on Earth. Okay. But if we crash... If we pull a plug or have a so-called mechanical failure and we crash in the desert, well, gee, sorry. I think you're taking what's I don't know how many there would be a year because we'll never, never really get an official maybe document saying, you know, 52 USOs, you know, logged this week kind of thing. I did, I did forget to mention the SOR space travelers password of the night i must update it now bill Crump, members of the sor space travelers club otherworldly is your password for tonight so make sure you use it wisely perfect it's perfect for tonight yeah well i like my answer the best uh blasphemous buddha in revolution radio's chat room stated maybe their air brakes failed I still think it's a Ford. <laughs> I, I still think it's a Ford recall. 
Claudia in the SOR Space Travelers mentions, because Earth women are so beautiful, they crash. This is true. This is very true. Over Vegas. Over Vegas. Well, well, I can tell you this. As someone who has seen a UFO on the ground, I can tell you that I did not hear that ship come in. I did not hear it leave. But I sure as hell saw it there because of the lights that came on. I'm sure there's crash sites like that. There is absolutely crash sites out there that have never been discovered. Oh, there's, yeah, there's the spots on this planet that man's never been to. Alaska, for example. And I mean, the Himalayas. Uh, there is places in the mountains that have been explored, so I have no doubt. And uh, you've heard the Tonganuska uh, explosion. That was like an atomic bomb. Um, I can't remember the, it was eons ago, a hundred, you know, a few hundred years ago. And no meteor caused that, but that, that just show goes to show we had UFO crashes back in, I don't know, the 17, 1800s. And I, I, actually, I think that was before that. I'd have to look it up. But, yeah. And, I mean, you have one one crash. That, I mean, Ron, Roswell was supposed to have crashed because it hit another spacecraft that crashed to Mexico. Yes. And, and you know what? I actually had a witness to that second crash on Space Out Radio about a year and a bit ago, a year and a half ago. A gentleman by the name of Gerald Anderson who hadn't spoke publicly in 22 years. He was five years old when he came across that crash site with his dad. And he walked up, he touched the ship, he touched one of the beings that was dead, he touched one of the beings that was alive. They were there for 30 minutes before the government arrived. And the theory on that is they collided over New Mexico because there was a major thunderstorm that night combined with the military radar that was going absolutely crazy because they were testing nuclear weapons in New Mexico at that time. You know, that it was just a bad a bad scenario where lightning may have hit one of the ships. It went boom. The first one went down immediately. The other one staggered over to Kelowna, which was the one for the Roswell incident. It's easier to come, cover up the second one when the first one is a weather balloon. <laughs> well, the whole thing with the Project Mogul is Project Mogul happened three or four years after Roswell. There was no Project Mogul at the time of Roswell. By the Air Force's own, you know, the Air Force prodded that out, and then it's like, oh, crap, we didn't know. Oh, well, nobody will notice. Don't pay attention to the man behind the people the draperies. Exactly. I have a couple questions in the Space Out Radio chat room on Spreaker. This one from Poet Laureate, Kareem DeWinter. Eric Squared, and we'll start with you, Cooper. What do yeah. you think of John Ventry? Do you think he was truthful or not? I'm, uh, I don't, I'm not going to come out and uh, voice my opinion. I think he believes firmly. Um, like, like all experiencers, I'm, I'm going to say, I think he believes his beliefs, and, and that's good. Everyone needs to. Um, I don't agree with him. I don't think everything is a demon. Um, I know a lot of demonologists, I know a lot of psychics and, and mediums that deal with entities on a regular basis. And out of, I don't know, 100 to 300 cases, have maybe seen a demon once, twice. There is say all grays, which I heard him say at the end of the show, are are, are, are demonic. No, <laughs> not by a long shot. So uh, that's why. I that. yeah, man. I, I agree. He believes. I think he believes in what he's saying. I think he's got some of it wrong. I think he's being in as much as he's he's going to that's us experiencers in a nutshell we know 
we were there. We knew what we saw, what we learned at the time, what the impressions were. And you just, there you go, having that way of documenting it. You're, you're hanging out there with the trees. But they were the greatest all. With so much of what perception is, isn't really understood. What we call reality, what we call solid, is on a molecular level. And there's nothing but empty space. So there's so much room for everything. Okay. But, but I'll debate you guys on this one for a little because you guys believe my stories. I believe your stories. That's his experience. And that's what his personal research has shown you. So therefore, how is he not going to come up with that format rather than something that you've experienced and learned, Eric, or, or you, Eric Rogers, or even myself? You know, I'm not trying to play politically correct here, but I can honestly sit here and say that you know you have to take their story at face value because that's what he's experienced. I fully, I fully agree, and that's why I said uh, I'm not going to debate him on it because that, that was his experience. Um, but then I would like to hear how much of an experience. What was his preconceived well, notion when he started researching? Did he lean toward, did he already have in mind the phrase or any demons that he only researched into sources that backed up? As somebody who's done research, I know how easy it is to skew your data by what you research when you're trying to set up an experiment. If you already had a preconceived idea that, or if you had heard some other ufologist or somebody say that, even if he wasn't consciously swaying himself toward that information that might have been in the back of his mind the whole time, and aimed him that way. Could be. Yeah, that that and religious belief plays a big part in everybody. And if you have to look at spirits in general, spirits in general can take on uh, the sign of a demon very easily. Most of most of your um, proclaimed demonic cases are actually uh, pissed off spirits. Spirits can uh, cause scratches. Spirits can uh, take on shadow forms. Uh, spirits, spirits can do the same thing. That's why not everything. The most true demonic cases don't come across the physical. They come across when a de when there's a demonic attack. It's more subtle and it's more um, psychiatric. Beyond so, so, like the way it was portrayed in the book, not the go into fiction, but kind of like the way it was portrayed in Constantine, where they nudge you toward a weakness you already have, <laughs> and make you get you know, weaker, and make you succumb to a temptation where, you know, where there's a chink in your armor. Exactly. Yeah, most demons aren't going to, most people that die due to demonic kill themselves because the demon caused them to, essentially. I, now, now on, on that note, I am curious, and I, I may pick up his book. I would like to hear more of his theories on him. Yeah, me too. And, and Char brings up a good point in the Space Out Radio chat room on Spreaker. And she's saying, he didn't say all were demons. He even wrote the book that proves that aliens exist. So we do have to give a little bit of leeway there. I do have a question from SJ in the Space Out Radio. She is saying, when we were talking about ships that crash, she's saying, what if those ships are crashing because they're not alien ships at all, but they're ours? Well, it's a good point. Um, my argument with that is. 